We've already looked at one pole filters, but there are certain things you can't do if you only have one pole. With a one pole filter, you can make a high pass filter or a low pass filter, but if you want to make a band pass filter, you're going to have to have two poles. One pole for the low pass side and one pole for the high pass side. We're going to be looking in this video at two pole passive filters. And we're going to start with an example of a bandpass filter. The easiest way to make a bandpass filter is to simply combine a low pass filter with a high pass filter and put a buffer right in between it. In the previous video, we saw how to design a simple buffer. The resulting circuit is shown over here on the right. The first thing I'd like to point out about this circuit is that it is indeed a two pole filter. And I can tell that it has two poles because it has two reactive elements in it that are not mathematically combinable. You see, it has one capacitor over here on the high pass side, and it has another capacitor over here on the low pass side. I could reverse those two. I could have the low pass filter first, followed by the high pass filter, and the filter would still be able to do its job. It turns out though, that you don't necessarily have to use a buffer in order to implement a bandpass filter. You can combine the reactive elements in other ways. To show how this can be done, we're going to look at a simple circuit, a resistor, inductor, and capacitor all in series. It's called an LRC filter. The first thing you might notice about this circuit is that it has two reactive elements, an inductor and a capacitor. Therefore, it has two poles. We're going to call the resistance R, the inductance L, and the capacitance C. And I'm going to define two other quantities which will be useful later in my derivation. I'm going to define omega naught as the square root of one over LC, and I'm going to define the letter Q to be one over R times the square root of L over C. For the time being, these are just definitions. They don't mean anything physical. Although later they will mean something physical, we'll get to it. In order to analyze this filter here, I wanna point out that we have a single input voltage, but we have three possibilities for the output voltage. It depends on how we define it. If we measure the voltage across the capacitor, then I could call that the output. If we measure the voltage across the inductor, I could call that output and likewise across the resistor. I need to pick one, so I'm going to start off by assuming that the voltage across the capacitor is defined as the output voltage. We'll look at the other cases shortly. I intend to use voltage division, so let's redraw the circuit just a little bit to make the voltage division clear. We have a capacitor and shunt, and of course all the elements are still in series. The transfer function is the output voltage divided by the input voltage. Using voltage division, we have only the impedance of the capacitor up in the numerator, and we have the impedance of the entire circuit down in the denominator. Although in this circuit, I defined the output voltage as being measured across the capacitor, I would get a very similar result if I had the resistor or inductor there alternatively. The top line here in the analysis shows what I just derived. It shows the voltage as measured across the capacitor. The other two lines show what the output voltage would be or what the transfer function would be reference to the inductor or the resistor instead. You might notice that in all of these equations, we have three different variables or three different circuit elements, R, L, and C. But if I combine them using the definitions over here on the left, then I can convert three variables into just two. I won't say how I knew to do that, but just bear with me. For now, you can just say, oh, he made a substitution. I started with R, L, and C, and I've converted that into omega naught and Q. It turns out that omega naught here is our corner frequency, and Q is something called the quality factor. If I make the substitution S equals J omega, I can see that in each of these three equations, I have two poles. I have two poles because I have S squared in the denominator. How about the numerator? For the top circuit, I don't have any S in the numerator, therefore I don't have any zeros. For the middle circuit, where the output voltage is across the inductor, I have an S squared in the numerator, therefore I have two zeros. For the third example, I have a single power of S in the numerator, therefore I have one zero. Let's make pole zero diagrams for these three circuits. And keep in mind, they are three different circuits. Although the input is the same in the three circuits, the output voltage is taken across a different circuit element. When I measure that output across the capacitor, I wind up with two poles and no zeros. When I take the output across the inductor, I have two poles and two zeros. Both of the zeros are at the origin. If I take that output across the resistor, I wind up with one zero at the origin and two poles. In each of the three circuits, the poles are in the same places, but you can see that what's changing here is the number of zeros. 
As you might recall, when we looked at the case of one-pole filters, there was a key difference between low-pass and high-pass filters. And the difference was that with the low-pass filters, we didn't have any zeros at all. But with the one-pole high-pass filter, we had equal numbers of poles and zeros. And that's exactly what we see here with the two-pole circuit. It's a low pass filter when we didn't have any zeros. It's a high pass filter when we have equal numbers of poles and zeros, and the zeros are at the origin. And it's a band pass filter when we have a single zero at the origin and two poles. Let's take a look at the Bode plots. How would we make Bode plots for these three circuits? Let's take a look at the low pass case first. Since we don't have any zeros at low frequencies, the line doesn't bend at all. When we get to the poles, they act together to cause a 40 decibel per decade fall. It's a low pass filter. In terms of the phase, it turns out that we bend down to negative 180 degrees, whereas with the single pole case, we would have bent only down to negative 90 degrees. How about with the high pass filter here? Because we have two zeros, the plot starts off with a 40 decibel per decade rise. The two poles act together at the corner frequency to bend it down by 40 dB per decade. In other words, to flatten it out. This gives us a high pass filter. The phase then bends down from 180 degrees to zero degrees, whereas with the one pole case, it would have bent from 90 degrees down to zero degrees. With a bandpass filter, we have a single zero, which causes us to have a 20 decibel per decade rise here from the low frequency side. When we get to the corner frequency, the two poles act together to change this by 40 decibels per decade. Combined with the 20 decibel per decade rise that we started off with, we end up with a 20 decibel per decade fall at higher frequencies. You can see that it has the shape of a bandpass filter. You can see that the phase also changes by 180 degrees. We now have stick plots or Bode magnitude plots, but let's plug in some numbers into these equations and see what the real plots would look like. Let's take a look at the band pass filter response first. I'm showing here three different examples. The corner frequency in each of these three examples is one hertz. In other words, omega naught is two pi radians per second. We can see that indeed the peak of the filter response occurs at a frequency of one hertz in each of the three examples here. We can also see that in each of the three examples, the phase bends from positive 90 degrees down to negative 90 degrees. What's different in these three examples, though, is the Q, or the quality factor. Recall that the quality factor was just 1 divided by R times square root of L over C. It's just a number that results from the choice of elements here in the circuit. It's just a number that pops out as a function of our resistor, capacitor, and inductor. As Q gets higher and higher, we're moving left to right in these plots. You might notice that in all three of these filters, we still have a 20 decibel per decade rise and fall on either side of the filter. Notice that this slope is the same in all three of these filters. And that's true on both sides of the filter. What the Q or the quality factor determines in a filter is how pointy it is in the middle. If you have a high Q, it tends to be more pointy. If you have a low Q, it tends to be more broad. If we look right at the peak of the filter's response and read down three decibels, the distance between the two arrows is known as the 3 dB bandwidth. It's omega naught divided by Q. Because Q is in the denominator, a high Q means that it's pointier. The 3 dB bandwidth here, for example, is larger than the 3 dB bandwidth over here. Let's now take a look at the low pass filter response using the same numbers that we plugged into the band pass filter. I'm keeping the corner frequency the same, and we have examples of three different quality factors here going from left to right. We can see that as the quality factor increases, we get more peaking in the filter's response. The same thing is true for the high pass case. When we have a high quality factor or a high Q, we tend to get peaking in the magnitude response and we get a faster turnaround in the phase response as well. The type of circuit that we just analyzed was a series RLC circuit. And we discovered that it could be used to implement a two-pole filter. Of course, a series RLC circuit is not the only possible implementation of a two-pole filter, though. There's other ways that you can arrange the two reactive elements in a circuit that can still give you a two-pole filter response. Those different design choices are called topologies. Let's take a look at some other possible circuit topologies. 
When I look at these circuit topologies now, I'm going to assume that we have a load resistor attached to our circuit. The filter, in a sense, exists between the two dotted lines here in each case. If the first filter element encountered by a signal passing by your filter is a series element, then that's called a series-fed filter. For example, we have an inductor in series, therefore this is a series-fed filter. Here we have a capacitor in series, it's still a series-fed filter. Down here, we have an inductor and capacitor in series, this is still a series-fed filter. In fact, this circuit down here at the bottom is essentially the same as the circuit that we just analyzed. Since we have a resistive element over here at our load, it's going to be a bandpass filter. Let's see if we can identify these other filter types by inspection. For the first circuit, we see an inductor in series. Remember, low frequency signals can go right through that inductor. That's an indication that it might be a low pass filter. Likewise, high frequency filters are shunted to ground through this capacitor, another indication of a low pass filter. These circuit elements do the same thing. They act together to make a two pole filter. For our second circuit here, we have a capacitor in series. Of course, that's going to block the low frequency signals. The low frequency signals, however, can go right through that inductor to ground. These two circuit elements work together to make a high pass filter. Over here on the right, I have some examples of shunt fed filters. You see, the first reactive element in our filter is not a series element. This capacitor is in shunt, meaning it's connected to ground. Therefore, this is a shunt fed filter. Here we have a shunt fed filter as well, with the inductor being the shunt element. The difference between these two filters at the top is simply which side of the inductor the capacitor is sitting on, but both of them are low pass filters. If I swap the order here for our second filter, it doesn't change the filter type, it's still a high pass filter. Likewise down here at the bottom, if I change the order of capacitor and inductor, I don't change the filter type. It's still a bandpass filter and it's still series fed in this case. Of course, we can also make a shunt fed bandpass filter. Both the inductor and the capacitor would have to be in shunt in order to create a shunt fed bandpass filter. There's another type of filter as well and it's called a notch filter. You could think of a notch filter as behaving in the following way. Very high frequency signals will go right across that filter to the load. The high frequency signals can't be shunted to ground because they can't make it through the inductor. Likewise, low frequency signals are definitely going to make it through that filter because they're blocked from going to the ground by the presence of that capacitor. Since low frequency signals are blocked and high frequency signals are blocked, it's those medium frequency signals that might be shunted to ground here. That makes a notch filter. The transfer function of a notch filter will look something like that. If we look at a series fed notch filter, we can think about it working in the following way. High frequency signals will go right through that capacitor. Low frequency signals will go right through that inductor over to the output. But for some very special frequency, right in between the low frequencies and the high frequencies, it'll have trouble getting through either element. That's how we get a notch filter. A notch filter will have two zeros on the imaginary axis and two poles, either real or imaginary, depending on the bandwidth of the notch. Bandpass filters show up in simple crystal radio circuits. As we've seen in one of my previous videos, it's not so difficult to create an AM radio receiver by simply combining a diode detector, an antenna, and a pair of headphones that have high impedance. But you can also use a bandpass filter in order to get some tuning. That is to filter out all the radio stations that you don't want to hear. Because the corner frequency of a bandpass filter is related to both the inductance and the capacitance of a filter, you can make one or the other tunable in order to be able to tune the center frequency of your passband. In this case, we have a tunable inductor. In this case over here, we have a tunable capacitor. In all of these cases, we basically have shunt fed bandpass filters. In the next video, we're going to take a look at this quality factor so you can see the physical significance of it.